Eternal's question, Eternal Fiki on Twitter, asks, Well, what are your thoughts on different gun metas in a game's life cycle? Would you have would you rather have different metas or keep using the same gun strats? Now, I didn't really like the question, Eternal. I appreciate the question. I just don't think it's a good one. Because, one, every video game on the planet has an evolving meta. If the game is like other games that aren't COD, where the game is meant to last forever just with updates, there's always an evolving meta. So that just kind of comes with the, the life cycle of the game. The only reason the meta changes in COD is because weapons will get uh, nerfed or buffed immediately. Or they'll just be agreed not to use. So, like... It depends what you're asking the question of. Because, like, games like League of Legends... They have to have an evolving meta to keep that game alive. They have to add in new characters, new abilities, new skins, etc, etc. Right? Yeah. And then there are the other games, like Counter-Strike. Where Counter-Strike has been the same game for... Basically 20 years, with the exception of a few tweaks to gun balance and map designs with certain things i lean more towards the side of counter-strike weapon town uh game balancing and updates because that has just always been what i've done like my entire life i've played traditional sports i played baseball like i said in the last podcast if you suddenly told me one day that i had to start pitching from 70 feet instead of 60 feet i'd be a little pissed I'm of the mindset that I would rather there be a set way things work and then I can progressively get better at that one thing until I've reached my peak. So that's where I like the Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike's been the same game forever. You have to get really good at what Counter-Strike is and then you compete against other people that have progressively been getting better at what Counter-Strike is. That's what I want COD to be, kind of. But that's not possible with a game that changes every year. Yeah, I 110% agree. Like, I like the fact that as soon as the game comes out, that's what you have unless, I mean, a nerf or something. But, like, if it changes too often, people are going to lose interest and not want to get better. Oh, that's another point I had. Oh, yeah. I had a... I'm trying uh, to think. I'm trying to think. I had, a, I had a really good thought earlier, then I forgot to write it down, and I just remembered it because it was what you just said. Uh-oh. Oh, it's, what, it's one of the answers to the next question. So. Yeah. Okay. I've given my thoughts on that. Do you have anything else to add to what you just said about... I, not really. I mean, I like the idea of it being the same meta throughout the entire year, and then as a new game comes out, then there's a new meta. Like, ideally, I would love Call of Duty to be exactly like Counter-Strike in the way that it's just the same game with the only time you have to adapt is whenever they add a new map into the rotation. That would be my ideal Call of Duty. I would... See, I, Go ahead. I like the whole every year you gotta adapt and change it up and find new guns and get used to new maps. But you see, that's where I disagree because, like, especially this game compared to, like, BO4. This, Cold War is BO4. The, the guns are just different guns. The Maddox is the AK. Maybe not the AK, but you get my point. Yeah. The Krieg is the ICR. The MP5 is the SOG. The AK-74U is... The other SMG people used. Maybe I have that backwards. The AK-74 is the SOG. Like, it's just reskinned guns. It's basically the same the gu same gun meta every year. But I, the maps are always different. And I would just... I'd rather prefer the same-ish guns. And then just have new maps brought in. And we have to learn occasionally. Because, like, I don't know about you. I, I'm sorry for saying this. Because this is going to make this podcast not safe for work. I would suck a dick for hardpoint seaside to come back actually 100 percent. like yeah that i enjoyed that map a lot i would do insanely disgusting things even for... control on that map that ma i feel like that map was super good it was because there's elevation there's interesting lanes there's interesting connectors there are points of interest you have to hold down you have to have some tactic because if you want to stream straight up banana you're going to get gunned by the guy sitting on the fountain with the AR. If you want to push through orange on the right side, that bakery, the left side rather, if you're attacking uphill, you have to fight your way through the SOG player that's probably going to be in there and the AR player. The best way to go about breaking the P3 hill on that map is going around the right side up the cliff, but the other team knows that, so they're probably going to have two players watching the back, and it comes down to just winning your gunfights and using your uh, tacticals and lethals at that point. Like, there's a sense of strategy to that. 
exactly. But like that, the hard point seaside, seaside <clears throat> at the at the moment in the in the game, seaside was one of my least favorite maps to play because of how just nervous it made me. Right. But like Is looking back on it, it was are. a good map. It made for exciting moments. How many maps in pro play ended on seaside hardpoint going to P three? And it came down to which sure, team was like better at breaking three P. It was a lot. I know Optic Gaming had four maps on Hardpoint Seaside where it came down to literally who won the rotation to P three and then held P three. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure like almost I mean, I'm probably wrong on this, but a lot of the maps on that ended at like two fifty to like two twenty. Oh, it was closer than that most of the time. Like it's a good map. Whenever the maps are that close, you know it's a good map. It just also made for a lot of exciting moments, and maybe I'm talking out of nostalgia because I still occasionally watch Crim Six's video, the greatest hardpoint comeback ever, where they beat Splice on CWO Vegas, I think. Where Crim mm -hmm. Six literally got a four piece in the hardpoint while healing and slide shotting Looney. Like, <laughs> maybe I'm just talking out of nostalgia, but Hardpoint Seaside is a map that I wish would come back. Honestly, did Black Ops 4 have, like, a really bad map? Uh, S and D. Oh, uh, I don't remember the name of the map. The missile map with the tube in the middle. S and D on the map that had the bomb site on the catwalk. Was that one really that bad? It was the worst one in my opinion. I mean, yeah, it was the worst one, but it wasn't that bad. It was still playable. I mean, it was like one of those maps that was bad, but it was like a fresh of breath air mad bad, a breath of fresh right. air bad because it was like oh. Like, would you rather play on that or Crossroads? Well, I mean, I have just said Crossroads is a flawed map. There's no saving it's, Crossroads. That's what I'm saying. Like, it, Crossroads is a bad map, and then you're saying that that was the worst map of that game. Like, that's... I get what you're saying, but... I'm trying to compare the two worst maps. Unless there's a map I'm just forgetting. Yeah, that one's probably my least favorite. Maybe, uh... Maybe... All right, we have to think back to BO4. Hardpoint, Arsenal, uh, Frequency, Hacienda. What the fuck is the fifth map? Uh, we were just talking about it. Yeah. Seaside. Yeah, Seaside. Seaside, and what was the fifth map? Arsenal, Frequency, Seaside, Hacienda. It's amazing how I played over a thousand hours in BO4. I can't <laughs> fucking remember what maps we played. Uh, oh, shit. oh, uh, gridlock. Yeah, gridlock S and D might be my answer for the worst <laughs> for the worst map in that game. Maybe gridlock control. I'll say it's tough. If I had a set squad, gridlock wouldn't have been that bad. I gotta figure out what the fuck gridlock was. It was the uh, it was the map in Japan that had showers. Oh. And the uh, bank truck that your teammate with the yeah. ICR would never leave when you were attacking the B side yeah. of patrol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all coming back to me now. Fuck that map. Yeah, we repressed that map. That's how we know that one's the worst. Yeah. But like even said, I still had fun playing that map. Yeah, I mean, it, if you were frying on it, it wasn't horrible. But let's move on because we have to finish up the cast soon. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Dr. Dabs on Twitter. He asks a uh, content question. Why is trickshotting not popular as it was back in the day? And this is what I was saying about you talking about the ever-changing meta of a game. That's partially why trickshotting died, is because trickshotting is so convoluted that you have to learn new stupid mechanics every year. And that's kind of why it died, because it didn't progress along with the games. Right. That's that's basically the answer for that. They kind of they kind of made it almost impossible to trick shot in some games. That is true, though. They did make trick shotting impossible with the newer games because I can't think of anywhere on Bo4 where there's anything above like a ten foot drop, other than the voids that just fall off the map. Right. World War Two. The only thing I ever saw a trick shot hit on was uh, Gibraltar. Lethal, we're recording a podcast. We're finishing up. Get out. Uh, that is, that's basically all of it. It's coming down to maps yeah. not being viable for the trick shotting in the future games, and then just 
And then Probably. I mean, the advanced movement didn't help at all. Advanced movement actually helped a lot because they didn't really? need they didn't need tall things to jump off. Then they just fucking went up. Yeah, I mean, I guess I feel. Like but that's the cool. thing that turned a lot of people off was the advanced movement trick shots because whenever you spend ten seconds in the air, what the fuck do you do? Exactly. That's, that's the standards that's just got ridiculous in jetpack games. And then I dropped my <laughs> fucking pen again. I hate it here. Bye, pen. I actually don't know where it went that time. We'll pick it up later. Oof. All right, trick shotting died because people lost interest in doing ridiculous things. Also, it's not really rewarding. Like it is rewarding, but at the same time, I'm personally me. I trick shot back in the day. I just got tired of wasting five hours of my life for nothing to show. I moved on to better things. I moved on to uh, esports, which is the next question: Is how did you get into esports? So, back in Modern Warfare 2, which was my first COD, I got into competitive sniping. I didn't know what Game Battles was, the t was at the time. I didn't know that existed. I didn't know there was professional Call of Duty. Or whatever it was in 2009. I just played competitive sniping, which... For my competitive snipers out there, like Dashi, who eventually transitioned into mainstream COD esports. We competed on a YouTube channel, which was called Sniper Leaderboards, which ranked the top... 1 to 50 teams that would compete in matches that they set up themselves. So it was essentially the same idea as game battles. But it was just a leaderboard that was moderated. It was more like a Discord server league than anything, but the idea of setting up matches and playing top 50 teams for points and then ranks was the same thing. So that would be my introduction to esports, I guess. And then I super got into it in BO2 because content nade shot and scump. So that's my answer for that. Mine, well, <clears throat> yeah, mine's probably Black Ops Two. Watching Nade Shot and Scum. I think it mostly came off of just like the league play option in the game. Like I'd play it with, but just random Which friends. Was the tweet I sent out earlier talking about accessibility? Right. Yeah, I mean, it was accessible. It was something different. I wanted to try it. I got a rank for it. I was like, why not? And then through that, I ended up finding content creators, Nade Shot, Scumpy, all them, and just enjoyed it ever since. Besides my Because, yeah, I'd challenge. always, like I mentioned earlier, I've always been a competitive player. I've played traditional sports. I played baseball. I've always wanted to be a professional baseball player. I played Call of Duty. Whenever I realized professional Call of Duty was a thing, I wanted to do that because that interested me. There's a sense of accomplishment whenever I beat somebody and actually get something in return for it other than a U1 icon popping up on your screen. And then BO2 was the perfect storm of one first COD champs. They promoted the fuck out of it. Which, you know, promotion, that was a topic last week. Haha! -ha. People got into COD Esports because you promoted a million dollar tournament. That's crazy. Accessibility to the option to play and league play. Because game battles is, one, not very well known, and two, it's kind of a pain in the ass to play. Yeah. And then three, uh, in tandem with the growth of COD Esports and BO2, I mentioned content creators that also did that. Most people probably knew Scump before they knew Scump played competitive COD. They probably just knew him as a pub stomper. And then whenever they realized what he actually did, he probably brought easily 500,000 fans to COD. Right. That's how I got into esports. Competitive sniping and then COD esports actual with Black Ops 2's competitive system, streaming system, and then league play system. And then the content surrounding Black Ops 2. Yeah, I'm pretty sure then, I got into it like right around the end of BO2, but I mainly dived into it during Ghost and AW. Like that was whenever I took my big dive into it and like started playing with teams, started playing in team scrims and tournaments and all that. Like, I didn't fully understand League playing BO2. I just kind of played it because it was something different. I never actually followed the breadcrumbs to the competitive actual, but I later found out. But anywho, last topic on the Q&A is how does content help teams? And I feel like this is a question directed at me asking people to make content, but <laughs> content helps teams because it separates teams from being Chicago Optic or Paris Legion. And that is my answer. That's a solid answer. I mean, 
Look at what we just said with Black Ops 2, Scumpy and Ninja. Content. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be on the, that level anytime soon, but that's like them making content got optic bigger. It gave people a reason to care about the players beyond they were yep. good at the game. Like, why is Atlanta Phase popular? Because of the decade of content that was made with Phase Clan before the CDL existed. In BO4, why did people care about Team Reciprocity, which was Johnny Dens, Wuskin, Dylan, and uh, Zed? Because Reciprocity made the Wreck in Vegas YouTube series where they basically just documented the team living in their fucking mansion in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. They made content around the team, which in turn gave that team fans, and then some of those fans just latched onto players like Zed, and then just continued following him through his career. Like Envy. Envy is more leaning towards the traditional, we're just good at everything, so care about us thing, but they do make content. Especially considering Post Malone is one of their owners now. Like, you'd be fucking stupid not to make content when Post Malone is one of your owners. Right. <laughs> Why do people like 100 Thieves? It's not because Nade Shot was good at COD, it's because Nade Shot was the COD father for Call of Duty content. Like, no disrespect to Nade, but I'd be lying if I said he was a top tier player. <laughs> HBR. HBR. He was actually good at SD and Ghosts, but that's like the one. <laughs> The one upside to that 100 thieves is popular because of all the fucking work nade shot put in making content behind the scenes that's the one thing i think killa said it when he was streaming one day is like nade may not have been good at cop but he was planning for the future five years before we knew what the fuck to do right. nade shot was making content in 2010 and we were laughing at him who the fuck is laughing now <laughs> yeah. and like that's coming from adam killa sloss one of the most blunt people on the planet yeah so basically, content helps teams because if you're good at COD, but you don't show people why you're good at COD, no one fucking cares. Like, Skump was one of the best players in COD, competitive COD, but Skump is more popular for being a pub stomper, or was more popular, like his videos back when he made BO2 content. He didn't get 8 million views on a video called That Trigger Finger because he was good at competitive esports. He was right. just a fucking nasty COD player that happened to transition over to, uh, transition his fans over to watching him succeed. And then also, let's talk about the golden days of Optic Gaming as my last touching point. I've never had a reason to care about PUBG or League of Legends or Dota 2 other than the times that Call of, uh, Optic Gaming entered those esports back when that was the good team. Mm -hmm. So... Optic Gaming, a basically console FPS roster entering League of Legends. They had an immediate fan base in League of Legends because of the decade of content they made prior. Yeah, so, my TLDR on that is... You're not going to have fans if you don't give people a reason to watch what you do. And, like, of course, there are instances where people are just naturally... They naturally get views because they're good at something, like your shrouds, like I said. But teams in general, organizations in general, if they make content, they'll generate fans outside of the uh, esport they're competing in, and then those fans will follow that team into the esport. Because that's why Optic Gaming got so popular, because people that watched Scump and Nade Shot's YouTube videos found out what they actually did, and then they started watching Optic Gaming. So, it's basically a repeating cycle of fan retention and fan conversion. But, that is my answer for that. Do you have anything else to add on that before we end? Because Lethal's itching to get in here. <laughs> uh, no, I feel like we pretty much covered that one. <laughs>